Hello everybody, this is Mel, the Scientific Trader here with another podcast for you today. Today's going to be different, um, rather than having lots of visuals, it's just going to be a audio, as in you're just going to be hearing my voice. Um, it's not going to be a marathon run as before, this one should only be about 20 to 25 minutes and it's really just to bring you up to speed with uh, what's been happening um, with my trading journey since I started the 90,000 project. Um, There's obviously been a lot of questions that have come my way by email, which I want to address as well. Um, So yeah, without further ado, I'll just get straight into it. This is going to be a kind of a run of a mill. It hasn't been rehearsed or scripted, so uh, please beware of any um, uh, moles or warts in terms of what I'm saying or how it's all put together. But yeah, um, so I'll start. Let me start with um, what's been quite interesting. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because one of the guys on Twitter alerted me to the fact that it, people are very strange, very strange, because um, the 90,000 project, which really kind of started moving forward sort of mid-June, um, it hasn't moved forward at the rate I would have wanted, but it, it's been trickling along. I mean, I'm profitable. I think I'm up by about £5,000. And, um, but... It has been frustrating start because, um, you know, some of the days there's been sideways motion or small profits. And then there's been a bit of a sort of to and fro, like profitable days and losing days and profitable days and losing days. And not yet sort of reaching the level of of stability that I I would have been wanting. Um, uh, and, And that's cool. I mean, when you're starting off a project, um, especially where you've made changes to the, um, the uh, architecture of of the the trading strategy there's going to be a bit of a balancing act over a period of time to get to to get that balancing in place because it doesn't matter how much you do um uh back back testing or um uh, theoretical modeling um there's always a a sort of disparity between what you're doing in the testing room as opposed to what you're doing in a live environment and that's because the live environment is never a lot of the times it's never in the perfect state you want it to be and so there's always adjustments you're going to have to make um, in order to get things a kind of synergy between what your expectations are and what the market's offering so that's that's cool that's fine and and so um it's, it's not a problem for me but what's been quite funny though is is the fact that um people um, the negative uh, wood lices in the woodwork only started coming out after I hit my first one of the first big days, which happened on Sunday, um, over sixteen hundred pounds, and it could have been two thousand, but there was a number of mistakes I made um, during the course of the day and and stuff. So, but I mean, it was sixteen hundred sixteen hundred pounds profit is is good profit, um, but all of a sudden people started coming out. Uh, and it was kind of funny because I was like, well, where were you when I was going through my losing days or my very low profitable days? And there's something about the human psyche where we, we like to glorify in our failures. Yeah. Um, and, and as soon as somebody starts hitting um, a particular level of performance that might be an exception to the norm or uh it might stand out then all of a sudden it's almost like you're out there to be crucified <laughs> and so it was it was kind of interesting because it was like well where were you like back in june when i was hardly making anything why wasn't you telling me you know so very interesting um and then the other thing is obviously this whole debate about why um am i not showing my the actual markets um now i did tongue in cheek say oh it's because you know my edge will be well just showing my markets um, isn't going to expose my edge. Um, but, however, um, I'm not that ignorant enough to kn- I'm not that ignorant to the fact that there are some very, very smart people out there that, um, with a large enough sample size of data from what I'm doing, will be able to reconstruct... I mean, they may not be able to reconstruct in in its entirety what I'm doing, but they will be possibly able to reconstruct something that then generates them money which they can then sell and i'm not going to be a feeder for 
people to be able to take my what I'm doing and then sell it off. I mean, even a couple of days ago when I hit that big £1,600, um, I think the following day, some idiot on Twitter then um, took a, a copy of my PL and then posted it and said, talked about inviting investment because it's the sort of money you can make. So God only knows what would have happened if he'd actually had access to what the markets were. Um, so yeah, so, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what I do know is that there are a minority of people that are listening to this who you are on the same conscious level as me in terms of you understand what I'm trying to achieve, you understand where I'm coming, where I'm going, and uh, we're, we're dialed in into the same frequency. We understand, <laughs> we're kindred, kindred spirits. And unfortunately, the majority of people are, you know, people that are just passing by, window shoppers who, you know, just want something that, you know, and, and the thing is, you know, one of the other things as well, and this is why um, I don't really engage a lot in any arguing anymore. It's, it's mainly because of the fact that I do know that um, a lot of people have really been um, burnt badly in trading. I mean, it, it can make you bitter. It can make you bitter and twisted and bitter and angry. And, and, and so when you actually see somebody that's achieving success, um, you know, um, it can make you angry, especially if that person's not revealing everything that they're doing, because then that makes you even more frustrated if you're, you know, struggling to make ends meet or... Um, you know, you, you, you kind of think, well, I'm an intelligent person, I'm an analyst, yet why is it that I'm not able to make this work? So I, I'm fully aware that um, sometimes the, <clears throat> the way that people react, it's not so much, <clears throat> it's not so much that they have um, bad motives, it's just the fact that um, their own personal experiences, maybe they got, you know, burnt out by sending money to somebody that promised them the earth and it just never happened. And so, it makes you very bitter, it makes you very negative, it makes you very untrusting of anything that you see which seems to suggest that it's the accept exception to the norm. Um, um, but that's part of the reason why I'm still showing the individual profits of each trade because um, I could have easily just shown, well, you know, for the dates, £500 or £1,600, but I think what can still help people is seeing, well, how was that accumulated during the course of the day? Because, you know, at the end of the day, I know some people are saying, well, it's redundant information if I don't know what the market is that you're in. No, it's not redundant information because haven't you heard of things like average, average daily losses, average um, daily profits, um, you know, some of those statistical um, obs observations which I've talked about previously which are dependent on knowing what is what is the individual um, what is the individual profits and losses that are taking place each day because over a period of time you can utilize that to generate an idea about um, how profitable a strategy potentially can be um, how a str how um, how resourceful a strategy is in, in being able to recover from um, from downturns and from setbacks. So unless unless you're somebody that's tuned in into the importance of knowing the data points as opposed to wanting to know what somebody's strategy is, it's the data points that's the actual um, key here um, in terms of if you want to understand um, how my project is moving along um because at the end of the day i'm not going to reveal the markets and that's that's just mainly because of the fact that last year when i was doing that i was bombarded with emails um i mean it was it was just chronic um because what people were trying to do was and you know at the end of the day you know you, you see the market you see the teams you try and look at the stats for the team and then you try and sort of build a, 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 a structure of what you think is um, actually influencing my decision making in terms of how I select my games. Um, and then questions were coming in, well, why didn't you select that game? Because that game had the same stats as the teams that you chose. 
And it just went on from there and it spiralled and spiralled. And in the end, I just said, you know what, this time round, I've learnt my lesson, not going to do that. It will force people to focus on the philosophical framework that underpins what I'm doing as opposed to just how am I selecting my games because my selection criteria is is that that is actually part of my age anyway and there's some very special people out there with very very analytical minds and very very um you know access to some very very sophisticated tools that could I think could possibly over a period of time take what I do and using certain types of artificial intelligence, model it and generate something. It may not be 100% in its entirety to what I do, but it could be awfully close. And then they start selling it. And so uh, (laughs) I will then be responsible for uh, making certain people quite wealthy and they're not even trading. All they're doing is selling stuff that I've based on things that I've done. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I've I've learned the hard way. And if I can learn the hard way, then can, so can others. And if somebody is consistently going on and on about me not being able to um, show my markets, then ultimately at the end of the day, it's because maybe you're frustrated because uh, things are not working out well for you. And you're kind of hoping that um, somebody can actually just give you that leg, leg over. Um, but um, I've outlined my reasons why I can't do that. And um, that's that's where it's going to be. But um, the journey has been quite interesting. Um, I've made a couple of changes to how I trade. Now, one of the things that highlighted how I was trading, especially when I started this whole thing last year, in terms of the first um, sort of public project, it was all based on what I called the sniper approach. And the sniper approach was the idea of... Um, taking your first four trades of the day and utilizing that as a benchmark in terms of whether you push on or not and I know for um, the sniper approach I had this particular framework that kind of akin to baseball where if I if my first three trades are losers or if I hit three losers in my first four trades then I'm out of there and I'm happy to move on to the next day and part of the reason for that was it, it really was really just a, a, a methodology of instilling some discipline into ensuring that I don't just trade on and trade on and trade on and trade on for the day in the hope of recovering my losses back or possibly, um, you know, starting off quite well and then giving it all back to the market. So that sort of baseball approach, free strike approach was really to install a, a sense of discipline and structure to how I was trading however you know things evolve and um, I never said that um, the snipe approach was you know the, the sort of lights out curtains in terms of methodologies it was really just at that time what I needed but as I've evolved as things have evolved I've realized that I've had to make certain adjustments to the way I trade. And, and the reason why I've had to make adjustments is because, because I'm now going for much bigger, rewa- a higher um, reward to risk ratio approaches. I mean, you've probably seen that um, looking at my results. You know, my liabilities are normally around £100, but you've seen that um, whereas before last year, my, my, if my liabilities were £100, my profits would have been around 150 160 170 um, what you're finding now is that my profits are now sort of £250, £300, £400, even £500. And so I'm dealing with reward to risk ratios, which are more sort of two, two and a half to, to five to one in that range. Um, the lowest I'll go for is around two. But um, by going for bigger reward to risk ratios, my win rate has come down to around the 40 to 43% range. And what that essentially means is that I'm now more susceptible to um, <clears throat> um, starting off the day with, you know, losing streaks of three, four trades in a row. So what I'm doing now is adopting an approach where I'm looking at 10 trades for the day. And what that means is, is that I can even have a situation where I hit, you know, four or five losses 
um, but still managed to recover the day um, because of the fact that my 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 profits are so much more bigger than my losses and so this this idea is is allowing me to stay in the game it's allowing me it's almost like um i would in terms of an analogy it's almost like um widening my stop losses um so you know in 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 financial trade and the whole idea of a stop loss is that um you allow well, the stop loss basically defines where you 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 come out of the market if you're if things are not going well, and I kind of felt that um, um, when you're dealing with a win rate which is quite low, um, if 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 you've got this if you've got this stop loss for the day where you're out after three to four trades, you may find that you're going to be um, having a lot of losing days because of the fact that your stops are too tight. So by just increasing my stops a little bit more it's just allowing me recovery time the ability to recover and the thing about you know dealing with um win rates where um your reward to risk is quite large is that when you hit those bundles of winners um it can really make make a dramatic impact impact in terms of your equity curve um and i've seen it you know happen um in terms of my trading results where i may not start off great for the day and then just you know three you know it's like seeing three red buses in a row they always seem to come at the same time buses you know when you're waiting at a bus stop uh you're waiting ages 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 and all of a sudden three or four buses turn up at the same time and that's what tends to happen with low win rate strategies in in that you're getting these a lot of small losses in terms of you know losses losses and then all of a sudden um you get three four big winners coming all at the same time and it just massively massively uh ratchets up your um your profit your your profit levels so that's that's the one thing that i'm doing now so you're good and and the reason i've managed to do that is because i've kind of also made some adjustments to how i trade so before it was all about late goals but um by by it being all about late goals, I had to then incorporate Bet365 because if I was depending on Betfair, I found that I wasn't getting enough um, trades in that I needed. And that was because with late goals, you've got to be so careful. You can't just go in with very sort of um, general, with very sort of high level generalizations about what you're looking for, like, oh, I'll just go for these teams because it's Liverpool or Man City, or I'll just go for these teams because they're part of the Icelandic league. Um, if you have that approach, what you'll find is in late goals is that you'll hit some very, um, very devastating um, losing streaks. Um, so with late goals, you've got to be so careful. Um, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack for the right trades per day. And so what it does, it limits your possibilities because what you're trying to do is also limit your 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 the exposure that can come with late goals and but what i decided to do is um there were other strategies that i've 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 had which were not late goals but they're still based on the principle of high reward to risk so when i kind of amalgamated all of those i then realized that i had a portfolio that was big enough to be supported by betfair alone and for me, ultimately, subconsciously, that's where I wanted to be because having to deal with Bet365 and all the challenges that they can present and then with Molly Bet, who were a great alternative, but obviously you're having now to send money um, out of the country because with Molly Bet, if you're dealing with Molly Bet, then a lot of the, um, a lot of the Asian um, bookmaker consulting firms that deal with Molly Bet, you know, they've got accounts in Cyprus and Malta and and stuff so at least um by dealing with betfair i can just keep everything in-house in the uk in terms of um the, the the funding of accounts and keep everything centralized by just dealing with one platform so in terms of reporting it makes things a lot easier for me um so yeah so so that's that's fundamentally why i'm just dealing with betfair now you're not really seeing bet365 i mean i do get my days with betfair where i'm still annoyed with them um where i can't understand why they will um, not have any games in play for, you know, uh, for China or um, Singapore. The other day there was a game and it wasn't even in play. 
and or, or it's unmanaged. I mean, there's been quite a lot of games in the Scottish League Cup that have been unmanaged. Just drives me crazy. But there's enough for me to be okay with Betfair. <laughs> Um, and, and so for me, that's kind of working out, that's working out, it, it just helps me, um, in terms of my, my attention and focus is just on one platform now. Um, not saying that I will never use Bet365, but for now, I've found a happy spot, um, in terms of the way I'm trading. And, um, I think it's just been a part of my evolution because, I could have always just been really sort of stubborn and just said, no, you know, uh, I can't change, I can't evolve. And that's probably, I think that's probably one of the things that makes it easy for me is the fact, because I'm not selling subscription services or selling a solution, it just means that if I need to make changes, I can do it and it doesn't have to, I'm not annoying anybody, I'm not making people think that um, I'm... um, you know that things are going wrong. I'm trying to. I'm trying to do something else. I, I'm at liberty to make adjustments as I go along, um, and it, it just gives me that flexibility of knowing that I can adapt, I can improve, um, and that's just the way it is. I think if you're um, if you're um, selling services, I think sometimes it can be more challenging to make radical changes to what you've done because people then might all of a sudden be on tender hooks thinking that something's wrong with what you was doing before when all you're trying to do is just improve. Um, but yeah, with myself, um, I'm happy um, in terms of where I am. It's been a slow start, um, but the slow start, I think, is starting to gather some pace now. I think over the next couple of days, the next couple of weeks, we're going to start seeing stability because um, I think initially, um, when I kind of really kind of moved forward in June, with this and um i think still i was still trying to sort of um you know balance out um things because you know price pricing isn't pricing isn't necessarily always at the perfect scenario that you would want when you're taking your theory into the market and so you've got to make slight adjustments but i think i'm in a happy a happy place now and i think as we as we journey along now as the account starts to move up um you know, we're going to be seeing some 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 really good levels of, of profit, which can, which I think will hopefully just inspire you to know that um, it can be done. Um, I mean, ultimately, the reason I'm doing this is because um, I just felt that um, I, I didn't see, um, I, I just didn't see enough evidence that one could push the boundaries. I kept being told that you know, you, you couldn't really expect to, you know, have an account which is £10,000 and, and basically hit £100,000 in, in 12 months. I was told that, you know, your expectation should be, a, you know, that probably you'll get to 30, 40k. Um, but somehow I just couldn't see how what people were saying resonated with probabilistic theorem. Um, and um, I've talked about probability theory, I've talked about simulations and how you get an idea, and um, I, I just couldn't see w- what, um, I, I couldn't just understand how some people were selling sports trading, I mean, you know, they were sort of happy trying to sell something where you make hundreds of pounds a month, and I'm thinking, well, <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm in this to, <clears throat> I'm in this to be, um, I'm in this for the long haul, I'm in this to, um, this is my pension, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to depend on um, a, p- a state pension or um, uh, having to work full time and do this on the side. This, this is this is serious stuff. So for me, it was about you know, can I truly make a big income from sports trading? I'm not saying can I make it quickly as in overnight, but can I can I truly have some goals I can set to achieve? And does probability theorem actually support, uh, is there a mathematical model that can support what I'm doing? Um, and obviously it's not just about the math, it's also about the psychology and the mindset because um, as we all know that um, when it comes to putting your own money on the line, there's a lot of emotional um, baggage from the past that can actually impact um, how you actually consistently, consistently apply what you're supposed to. So I'm aware that it's not just about methodology, that there's, there's a lot more variables um, to it. 
to, 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 to the whole portfolio that's needed to make things work. But ultimately, what I'm trying to do is um, reach a point over the next two years where I can hit levels where um, I, I'm consistent enough and I've got the evidence enough to attract um, the in equity investment. I mean, obviously, I'm in talks now regarding um, you know the parameters needed to set up a private equity fund, the types of accounting firms that um, you can utilise to manage the equity fund and, and manage... Um, contracts with um, potential investors. Uh, I'm not into taking people's money and saying, hey, send me your money, let me see what I can do. Um, this thing has to be managed properly by reputable firms that are actually controlling and all I'm doing is the trading. Um, so those are things I'm looking into and that's why, um, for me, social networking is a powerful platform because there's people that have contacted me already and said, yep, we are watching you, Mel, and let's see how things ramp up, you know. Um, you can't just base it on six months data. Uh, it's got to be at least two years. Uh, and that's why this, there's more to this than meets the eye. Um, some of you, you know, just sit in there and I, I, I don't know what your objective is, but um, you've got to understand this is part of a bigger agenda for me personally. Um, and um, whilst I hope it benefits you in terms of you being able to pick up certain things from my philosophical approach. Um, um, this isn't, for me, just about showing you my results and gloating, because there's no point. <laughs> Why waste time? Um, ultimately, it's because um, social networking is a very powerful platform for getting publicity. And if you can't see that, then it's, 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 it's astounding, because at the end of the day, um, it should be clear to see that um, I've talked about this in the past and talked about um, that um, it's not just me about about Mel trading in his bedroom and making um, a tidy sum of money each year. Um, I'm looking to push the boat bigger for this because it can be pushed bigger if it's done in the right way and you've got the right people around you and you've got the right tools and the right framework around you as well. So that, that's basically my objective and that's my goal. Um, there have been certain things that I've had to look at in terms of, well, if I'm trading a fund which is, I don't know, a quarter of a million um, in terms of liquidity, and that's, it's kind of funny because I did a SWOT analysis of everything that I do in terms of trading, and there were certain um, weaknesses that are inherent, which I've been looking at ways to negate some of those weaknesses, like liquidity, because, you know, when you start trading with a bigger fund, what's going to happen when you go into some of those exotic leagues where liquidity isn't that great. And there's some things that I've had to look at in terms of possible modification of approaches um, and stuff like that. So I, that's why, for me, this whole journey is constantly evolving. I can't base things completely on how it was, you know, last year. I've, it's just a never-ending process of improvement. And um, hopefully, over the course of the next couple of months um, you can start to see the results of that in terms of my results and in terms of what, what I'm trying to achieve so that's where I am today it's just just a bit of a a, a, a waffling about where I am I haven't got any um, slides for you to look at it's really just an insight into where I am and hopefully you'll understand that where this journey is taking me um, and uh, I will continue to update you on a daily basis and uh, probably put out webinars um, every, probably every two weeks, I think, is good um, because there's a lot can happen in two weeks. So I think um, I was a bit radical thinking I could do this on a daily basis or three times a week. But I think every two weeks is just right um, because um, it just gives enough meat on the bone in terms of how things are going that I can reflect on examine and give you my insights um there were some questions that i just wanted to answer somebody sent me a question saying would i ever take up tennis and the answer is yes um i, I do believe that probably by next year i'll be looking into tennis um i, I did come across um, somebody sent me a link and there were some very interesting um insights that i saw from um sports trading sports trading pro sports trading life I can never remember if it's Sports Trading Life or Sports Trading Pro, but they're, they're an online 
um, educational academy for sports trading and um, I've seen some of their stuff on tennis and I think it's very very good and tennis really is great because of the fact that you get a lot of swings and is uh, if you're somebody that really believes in the whole idea of, of high reward to risk ratios as, as the infrastructure for what you do then tennis trading is, is fantastic um, so yeah I, I will probably look into tennis next year um, but certainly for now my interest is football because I'm just trying to consolidate and really move to a next level um, and I think tr- I think football is more tra- is probably more challenging than trading trading uh, more challenging than tennis because tennis has a lot more ebbs and flows whereas football um, it's it's a lot more <laughs> difficult and that's why a lot of us have suffered over the years because um, football is a very very difficult sport sport to trade profitably consistently and um, you know we're all trying to find that formula that really has the longevity for us to make serious income but it's very difficult I will never deny it I will never deny how difficult it is and the fact that you know trade I mean I was I remember speaking to somebody last week I was having a meeting with somebody and saying it's amazing that trading is one of those professions where it's one of the few professions where you could put your energy, your effort, hard work, educational knowledge into it. And still, after two, three, four years, you come away battered and bruised without any success. It's just one of those things. It's really crazy because, you know, the way that we're accustomed to working, especially in a sort of corporate environment, is that the more effort you put in, the more dedication, the more work, the more, um, you know, whatever you put in results in the output. But trading is completely different. And so there's some of you listening where you will never make it in trading. You will never make it in trading because it's just one of those things that it's just not to be for you. Uh, and that's, that's the sad reality. That's actually the harsh reality of trading. Um, but you have to, I suppose, go on a journey where you test whether it's actually you or whether it's somebody else that it's not, it's not out for. Um, and I, I came mildly close a number of times where I, I nearly caved in and said it wasn't for me. And luckily and fortunately, um, things have sort of turned around. So hopefully that answers a question about trading. Um, another question I had was in regards to... Um, um, it was actually in regards to um, the different the markets, and I think I've answered that in terms of no, it's not just late goals. It's actually a portfolio now that I operate with, because late goals was um, very restrictive for me um, for a number of reasons, which I've ha- highlighted earlier on in this um, in this podcast. Um, another question that I had was in regards to um, it was in regards to the um, countries going into different countries and yeah I do I do go into different countries so I don't I'm not really somebody that just is dependent on the big leagues um, so going into the likes of Lithuania, Estonia, Gibraltar, um, you know the lower leagues of Norway, Iceland, um, the lower leagues of Sweden, um, Kazakhstan I mean these are all uh, leagues that um, I go into and the only thing that limits me from not going into those leagues is whether Betfair actually is covering them. To be fair, Betfair have slightly improved. Um, I've, I have noticed that with some of these lower leagues, they may not necessarily cover all the games that are available for that day, but they will cover a couple of them. So that's, that's good for me. It shows that there is some improvement taking place with them. Um, but yeah, the lower leagues um, for me are great. Um, because of the fact that, um, you know, they provide the additional um, leverage that I need. And sometimes with lower leagues, you get some real um, odd pricing that goes in your favour. And I think it's probably because um, the less developed the markets are for particular leagues, um, the more chances there are of odd behavior i mean i saw one a couple of i think it was back in hong kong and the price 
the price that was showing at the particular time interval in the match, it was just grossly wrong. And you just knew that it was because the market it was still in its infancy and pe- the, the people in that who trade in that particular country um, probably... Um, <laughs> well, anyway, I was able to take advantage of it big time and came out of a big killing. Whereas you know that if it was the UK, France, Germany, Belgium, Spain, Italy, it was impossible for pricing to be like that um, uh, for that particular time interval. So with exotic leagues, that's one of the good things is that sometimes you can really take advantage of the fact that um, the, 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 the pricing seems, for some reason, strange reason, seems to be sometimes not consistent as, and that can give you the opportunities. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've answered the question about how many times I trade per day um, and what I tend to do after 10 trades if I know that I'm in a strong position I'll push on like I did Sunday I think ultimately on Sunday I did over 20 trades but most of the time in the week it's probably going to be around 10 trades but certainly Friday, Saturday and Sundays I can push on if there is a, if there is a very strong um, justification to do so um, another question I had was about uh, game state. Do you think that um, the do you think that what happens early on in the chat? Um, yeah, I, I looked into this uh, uh, last year. Uh, this whole um, concept of what happens early on in a game um, can impact what happens later on in a game. Um, and I, I, I do believe that um, there is there is a particular point to be made that uh, if you have early goals in a match, it does seem to precipitate more goals in a match. However, one of the things that I've also had to be aware of is what I call um, trader's bias, which basically means you're only looking for the things that you want to look for. Um, and um, that can also happen as well in terms of how you analyse things um, in the sense that you're only seeing what you want to see and which is quite a dangerous thing actually um, so yeah I, I, I do see um, and it was something which um, I, I think had some merit in it but ultimately um, I think that um, you can only judge something based on performance um, and when I say performance, um, I'm talking about something that can be scaled up. It's very easy to talk about testing results where you're only putting on a couple of pounds here or there. But what about when you're putting on thousands of pounds? How easily scalable is it? How easy can you scale that up? And what type of mindset, psychological mindset, do you have to be equipped to to manage scaling it up to big levels? And um, so I think we've game state uh, if somebody is telling me that they're putting on you know liabilities of a hundred two three four hundred pounds then and and they're doing it consistently and making a lot of money then yeah there could be some merit um, in, in what they're doing but um, it's not for me to say because it's not something that I'm really looking into too tough um, the last question was um, in regards to um, software that I use um, yeah, I do, I do use um, a, a number of, of tools, but I, I because I've amassed so much data of my own back, I do have my own analytical tools. So one of the things I use is a programming language called SAS, S-A-S. It's something for the SAS Institute. Um, it was, it's a programming language that's used quite commonly within the pharmaceutical industry. And SAS, it's kind of like a table a table um, type um, uh, package, but I use that to do a lot of modeling and do a lot of analyt- analysis analysis of my data, um, 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 and I I also use a lot of Excel as well, Microsoft Excel. Um, but uh, a lot of the things that I'm doing is of my own back in terms of my own sort of internal data analysis um, of of data because I've just got a lot of data now, so I can really base things on what I've already got in-house. So hopefully that answers that particular question. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I'll, I'll call it I'll call it quits here. So hopefully, hopefully this has been a bit useful for you. 
Um, it won't be useful for anybody, everybody. And I've, I've recognised that probably, you know, 80% of the people that follow me on Twitter that um, probably only 15, 20% of you will resonate at the same frequency that I do in terms of where my mindset is and in terms of understanding where I'm coming from. Um, and that's cool. That's cool. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm not trying to win the world over. I'm just trying to put a few things out there that some people can catch on to and it can make a big difference as it did for, uh, for Bennett. Uh, Bennett was somebody that I, um, I wouldn't say mentored, but certainly me and Bennett had a very good relationship over the last sort of 12 months, um, where I really helped him to, um, look into various things as, as well as him helping me, actually, there was some great stuff I learned from Bennett, um, in terms of, um, in, in terms of what I was doing, but Bennett is, is much stronger now, uh, much stronger and much more profitable. And, uh, I didn't charge you anything, did I Bennett? <laughs> but yeah, so, um, but yeah, there's people out there that I know that have benefited from what I'm doing. And, um, I think if I, if I think, um, you know, you can see between the lines if somebody's just trying to put results up there to show off. Um, it's it's not about showing off. It's about my particular purpose, which I've talked about. But it's also about you taking what you can and also discarding what isn't relevant for you. Um, you know, you might find that there's certain things I talk about which you can take on and there's other things that you don't. And that's the whole part of this journey is that it's just putting things out there that you can take and discard um, and and so create your own create your own legacy create your own masterpiece yeah it's not about me trying to change the world and get everybody to commit to the way I trade not not at all um, in fact the way I trade is actually amalgamation of what I've learned from different people different mentors different tutors different concepts and molded it in something that works for me um, so yeah, so find, find, find your own legacy, find your own journey and keep your spirits up. It's an exciting time as we head back into August, September and let's kick some butt. Catch you later.